think we're going to be ready here in a second. Oh, perfect. Perfect, perfect. Okay, great. So, off to the races. I have her face right at the right height. So, this is uh, what's called sight size um, painting. Generally, it's done with uh, still lives or a live model where you um, paint the same size as the, your reference and you and you stand the same distance away from your reference and in this case I am um, okay if you can talk louder or get closer to the phone let me see maybe the maybe if I put the phone volume did that make any difference putting the phone volume louder or just doesn't um, just I just need to talk louder um, okay, so I'm going to get closer to the phone, and um, so I'm painting what's called sight size. So the panel and the um, a little okay, the panel and the in the reference image are exactly the same size. So what I can do is measure on the monitor my different um, my different landmarks. So if I measure the eye, for example. I can you know, mix a little bit of uh, color to put down to begin with. So if I measure, I'm measuring the eye from the edge to right now the pupil. So that's going to be somewhere around here. And I can measure from the top down. And that is going to be right there. I can measure again. One. Yep. Just over a little. So I know that my her eyeball is going to be right there. And then I can measure her other eye this the same way. Measure again. The measuring part this is the part that um, kind of goes a little slowly, but once you get your landmarks in and you do a little drawing, then the, the painting actually goes a lot faster. You have a little more confidence that you're painting things where they need to go. Just putting in some light reference. Um, I'm going to grab the corner of her cheek and her chin right where her chin turns as a as a landmark so this needs to be around here and i can either measure from the top or the bottom at this point right where it turns it's not a real hard point in space it's a little easier if i say like the bottom of uh where the ear comes up and meets her her jawline that's more of a kind of a definite point. Um, let me do it from the top first. So the ear to the jawline. And I can eyeball these in. A lot of paintings I do eyeball it first and then I and then I correct it, but um, just wanna just get to the point tonight. Um, so looking like right. Doesn't, almost doesn't matter what color I'm using here. All of it's going to be overpainted as I'm working. Just grabbing a little bit of color that's on the palette already. Now her eyebrow is there. So let's make it a little more defined. Again, I end up moving these things all around as I'm working. Just usually, I'm I'm trying to work towards a likeness. Most of my paintings have a a fair amount of likeness to the to the final painting. I mean, to the to the photo. And I think I didn't make her eyebrow high enough. So at the highest point of her eyebrow is right up here. Yeah. 
a lot. So there, I am going to mix some color, the actual closer to the flesh tone, so that I can cover over some of those those lines. Um, that's usually how I jump into the painting, is where I'm covering over my mistakes. And that just gets me to start to put down some, um, some real paint. So now I need to actually get closer to her eyebrow color, which is mixing a little bit of orange, black, to get kind of more of a brown, a little more orange. So the way my palette works is I do a combination of what's called tint tone shade color mixing and complementary color mixing. Uh, it's really a hybrid of two different ideas. One is sort of an impressionist idea of, um, of mixing uh, complementary colors together to get to neutralize more saturated colors. And tint tone shade is where you mix white, black, or a combination of white and black with the colors to, um, to alter the intensity of the color. And the tint tone shade idea gives you a much higher intensity of, of color in the finished painting. It actually is a little counterintuitive because you think that an impressionist uh, palette would give you higher key color, but it, it doesn't. It's, uh, it's when you're mixing from across the palette that you tend to neutralize the colors more. And actually, I don't even think uh, most Impressionist painters actually realize that, that they're um, working to make duller colors. I am going to keep the white of the eye really blue to begin with, because in the end, um, I don't want the eye to, white of the eye to be white. I want it to be, um, I want to leave some room for the highlights um, in her face to be the, the lightest light. I do see her eye color as being kind of a bluish green with a little, little bit of gray. But again, um, I want to start with a little more color than it actually has because in the painting process and correcting, it tends to go a little bit grayer. And that's, and I'm going to have to get some black in there. Her, the, where her, um, her iris is below the, the eyelid. There's a little bit of shadow there, and that helps give a little bit of depth to maintain that color change or value change. And then, generally speaking, if the light source is coming from above, in this case, it's coming from the upper left-hand side, the lower part of the iris is going to be lighter in color because of how the light travels through the lens of your eye um, makes that part of the eye a little bit lighter. So you're actually getting light that's reflecting through the eye. And then you know, a lot of instructors will say, don't put your highlights in right away, but I just can't help it sometimes. I just like to sense the glassiness of the eye. I don't care if it's in the wrong place. I always can move it later. Sometimes I'll repaint an eye a hundred times in a painting. And um, I might as well just even remeasure at this point to see if I'm even close to where it needs to be. It's not too far off. Um, or at least laterally, it's not too bad. Uh, uh, uh. Okay, let's see. Yep, that's in the right place. And now I can start to do, put in a little bit of uh, closer to the right value here and the right color so that I am going to get that sense of it actually looking like the white of an eye. Um, I'm not being too careful or exact yet, um, probably to my own detriment, but I'm just trying to keep it loose to begin with and get get it moving along so that um, I I started what about 835 um, I'm 
don't know how long I'm going to paint for. Um, usually when I'm painting this late at night, I can go on for um, several hours. Um, but you guys are joining and watching, so I, um, I don't know how much patience you guys will have, whether you'll want to go and come back or just watch for a little while. Um, I can already start to sense the depth in the eye that is, um, that helps me paint. Um, there's, you're sort of painting on two levels at the same time, or at least I do. I'm trying to, to maintain the shapes, the relative shapes in, from the photo. Um, that's a two dimensional idea, shape to shape and get some accuracy in shape. Um, but then as the painting starts to look more dimensional, it, you have, you can have this feeling like you're actually painting on the sides, tops and bottoms of elements in the painting. And that really mm -hmm. does become, uh, helpful when you start to see those things because it's easier to correct when you when you see that those things are working or that they're off because you really do feel like oh yes um, the side of this eye was this turning this fast and I kind of like it I usually don't get there until towards the end of the painting where the painting really starts to feel dimensional, but if it starts doing that right away, I, I like it. Um, really makes me feel like I am turning the forms of, of the face and have a little bit more control over what's going on. How's that looking so far? Are you guys seeing, is that interesting, the, the way this is coming along? I'm, I think I'm using too soft a brush for the beginning here. I need to get a really big brush going. So I was using a, a round, I think it's like a number four round, can't read it. You can see it there. And I'm switching to a, I really can't read the numbers on this thing, but it's like a 12, a 10 flat or something like that. And that'll allow me to get a little bit more paint on more quickly. And a flat is gives a kind of different feel to the painting. If you use it for a whole painting, the painting will let, have more of a chiseled look to it. Um, because you're really kind of creating very square shape strokes and that can give it a little bit more of a sculptural chiseled feel. I'm going to lighten up part of that eyebrow a little bit. It is really a orangey black or brown. I hate to use the word brown, but um, because it really doesn't describe the color that well but um but a reddish neutral i guess can have a little more red in there and i'm seeing around the eye i'm seeing some some reds and a little bit of greens and sometimes i like to exaggerate those a little bit um so that there's more interest in the face throwing some a little bit of yellow in the color and it's not green enough for me that'd be a little more exciting okay there really get some green in and these uh, shapes in the face are really kind of blending together i might change the color even though they're like very close to the same value so that there is a sense of direction change but i still want to maintain the the fact that those elements are grouping together visually. So two contradicting ideas that they're grouping together, but they're also facing in different directions. And 
I need to widen that eye a little bit, get a little more white in there. It's just all adjusting these little adjustments. And sometimes just have to slow down a little too. Get that under line. Okay. Right. Um, and a little bit of the eyelash. And I'm going to widen that pupil a little too. I mean the iris. Okay, that's looking good. Has a little bit of softness to it. It's not looking exactly like a photo, but it has a nice feel to it. So we'll see how that holds up as I do the rest of the uh, rest of the face. So you you do start to get a sense of um, dimensionality there. Here it's a little bit sloppy, so it's a little hard to read. But there is some transition values as you get towards the um, this brow ridge here as you get near the brow ridge and try to make that a little bit more okay and then there is a highlight this is one area where I'm going to try to get a little closer to my lightest light because you get some reflected light right in that spot and above the eyebrow right here and I'm gonna to have to adjust that later, a little bit later in the painting. Okay. Are you guys hearing me okay? Okay, I'm gonna keep on going here. That green that I put in there, it's too green. So I just wanna bring it a little closer to that other color, add a little more red. At some point I'll be able to do these live demos where I have a camera pointing at the palette. I have another camera pointed at the photo and a third camera pointed at the painting. And so you guys can get a good shot of all three as I'm working, but I'm not there yet. Technically, it's a little bit challenging to do all that and I'm just learning. There are some uh, YouTube live settings that allow you to use different cameras, but I'm not sure yet about multiple cameras. So what I'm doing right now is I'm working my way out from this eye that I've established here. I know it's the right place on the panel where I want it. I like the way it's looking. Um, for the most part, the values around it are pretty good. And so as I work out, I'll be making some subtle adjustments um, and just trust that all, all of it's going to fit together. Sometimes I like to paint where I put in kind of the mass colors of the, of the painting. And so the um, general color of the whole face, which would be called the half tone. So the general color of the light side of the face and then the shadow side, and then really work to get the, um, the edge or the transition between the two uh, right, and then go in and put in the details. But on this particular painting, I feel like um, picking a spot and working out around it and um, and so that the whole painting seems to appear out of one central spot, kind of. If you see a time lapse of this, it would be like the whole painting is growing from, from one place. I can start to put in the ear, and the ear is partially in shadow, so the top of the ear is going to be a darker value. I'm just, I don't even know if that's the right color, but, um, it's a good start. I like to work on a white panel um, to begin with. And I may experiment at some point um, putting down a neutral color. Um, a lot of artists like to put down a tone because it's easier to judge your values if you start off with, uh, with a tone panel. 
I've just gotten used to um, painting um, painting off a white background, so I just know, I guess more intuitively, I know the color that I want. Um, and so, I, also a lot of artists will pre-mix a lot of their flesh tones. I try not to do that just because um, there's no such thing as flesh tones. I know I said that I'm I'm getting into very dangerous territory here by saying there's no such thing as flesh tones. Um, basically, colors that you see are a combination of a local color and the color of the light that that hits it, and that's never going to be the same between two photos or two live setups. You're never going to have the exact same colors. Um, that if you pre-mix your flesh tones, what you end up having is all your paintings kind of look all the same after a while. And what you're also missing is the variety of colors that are really there. Um, the yellows and the greens and purples that you would naturally see. Um, like here, there's something that's just a little bit greener right here coming um, off the turn of the cheek into the nose. And if I premix my colors, I really couldn't just jump in with something that was much greener there. This I'm going a little bit too dark here, so I'm going to try to go lighter and more red, which is hard because I have to mix really cleanly to get that. Um, I can come back in later and correct that, but. And I'm just going to go in with some straight white here. I'm I'm painting what's called a la prima, which is wet into wet painting. A la prima means um, kind of all in one go, meaning you're not doing an underpainting, you're not glazing on top, you're just painting all at once. And so you have to be able to paint in a way that um, you're approximating the color uh, what the color is going to be based on the color you have on the brush and the color that you already have down because the two are going to be mixing together. And so it's always a little bit of this kind of uh, uh, estimation calculation to figure out what the color should be. I am going to throw in a little bit of black around the ear. That's going to help give me my darkest dark and help me see the values a little bit better. So you can see what looked very dark at the t tip of the ear starts to look lighter as I throw some dark around it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. Um, just do a little measuring. That's very close to the edge of the panel and I don't have it that close. So let's see if I can throw some brighter red in there or tip of her ear. This is where there's a little bit of blood in the ears, uh, especially if it's cold out, your blood goes there and uh, to the nose and the cheeks. Something physiological there. I forget why. To keep you warm? I don't remember. And Okay. So what I don't know from what I put down so far is where are the landmarks in the nose. So I am going to do a little bit more measuring at the very corner of the eye. And this edge of the nose is just vertically just outside of that. So here and the bottom of the nose. All this measuring is, um, it's important if I'm going to get a sense of the, sense of the likeness where all those landmarks land. And it speeds the painting along because, again, like I said, I have a lot more confidence that I'm putting down strokes where they are going to be in the end. 
And I've just learned over the last few months, I've had a couple of paintings go really wrong where I didn't have enough of the measuring um, done correctly. And I have a video on that, actually. The, there's a video of a woman named Zanetta, uh, a, I want to say she's Russian, but I'm not sure. Um, can't remember offhand. But anyway, she lives in London. She's a model. And I did a painting of her from Sketchy. And I had to repaint her face maybe six or seven times before I got it right. And part of that is that I didn't take the time to do a real good measuring job. Okay, getting a little bit of green in there. And there's this crease underneath her eye that's actually much darker than what I painted it. And then there's some green coming in there too. Okay. Uh, let's, and I see if I squint, squint is the most important tool that the artist has in his tool bag because it takes um, what you painted and blurs it so that you can um, see how you're doing. It's, it's similar to like stepping back and looking, but blurring, since I'm sitting in a chair and it's hard for me to get up a lot um, while I'm painting, um, squinting is the next best thing. It tends to bring all the, it blurs out all the details so that you can s judge the values much better or the placement of things. I have this red area here alongside the nose. I established that it's right there. So that looks too low, but um, yeah, I guess that's right. I think I need to get the nostril in there to really start to judge. And I'm switching to a smaller flat for the nostril. So I can just be a little bit more um, exact about the shape. I'm just going to just put a dot there and then measure it because I am not confident in it. Oh, that's pretty good. And this edge. That looks pretty good. Okay. So now a little more confident. This is where the nostril is. There's some red around it. That red is, um, you'll see in a lot of um, portraits and you'll see it in the photo is essentially the light that's passing through the the f through the nostril and lighting the skin around it and also a little bit of the the blood in your skin that's in that area so the combination of two can make the inside of the nostril look very red and i'm getting to close to where i would put the highlight I am not going to wait. I want to see where that highlight is. So I'm just going to put in a little more of the shapes around there. And the light underneath the nose where this um, light source that's to the upper right is hitting this plane very strongly. And then there's also a highlight as it gets closer to the upper lip. And I am going to put in a little bit stronger the shadow that's alongside of the nose. It's kind of a reddish red and black together. Okay, and I actually, before I go and put in the highlights, I want to maybe get an indication of the other nostril. And I am putting that pretty dark, but what I don't have is the values around it quite right yet. All this is painting is a, how do you say it, is an exercise in adjustments. It's all about putting something down and then seeing if it looks right and then changing it until it does look right. And as you do more paintings, you your judgment gets better both in what you put down initially and how well you are adjusting it. So 
um, I'm still somewhere in the middle. Like sometimes I get it right the first time and sometimes I adjust it right after that. Um, but usually I have to adjust it 30 or 40 times and I want that highlight in there now. So I have the right brush. I have this smaller flat and I can get that highlight in. Generally want it thicker paint because I want it not to mix so much with the paint underneath. I really want it to sit on the surface and that really gives it that quality that it's um, reflecting light the same up here, but I have to get the darks around it before it reads correctly. And it's a little bit lighter here. having a little bit of, this is where the tin tone shade color mixing comes in. I have black and a little bit of green to get into this part that's just underneath the eyelid. Sometimes when I'm painting, I'm just painting shape to shape and I don't even realize what I'm painting. And other times I, it's helpful to name what something is. If I say in my brain, this is the under part of the eyelid where this corner turns then that's really becomes very helpful in painting it. Sometimes it gets in the way though. If you name something and you have a preconceived notion of what it looks like, um, sometimes oh, if you know it's the ear and you know it should be, you know, the top of the ear should be close to the, the eye, then you, you may end up painting it in the wrong place because the angle of the head may mean that the that top edge of the ear actually is higher or, or lower. Oh, painting all over this. My monitor is just one big smudge of leftover paint. So the top of the ear is aligned with somewhere in the middle of that, um, that eyelid, um, just as an example. Okay, so I'm gonna keep this moving along um, and get some of the colors in the forehead. So, just from experience, foreheads are going to be more orange than the middle section of the face, the jaw, the muzzle, around the mouth is going to be greener and yellower. Um, I've heard uh, Jeffrey Watts, who runs a Watts Atelier, is a, is a painting school or an art school out of I forget what they are, somewhere in, somewhere in the Southwest. Um, he calls it the Neapolitan effect, which is, I, I find that really cute, um, but it's a good way of thinking about it. If you have a orange stripe across the forehead, um, reddish stripe in the middle, and then greener stripe at the bottom, and this isn't gonna be true with everyone's face and every lighting situation, but it does give you sort of something to look for to um, to make a, a better choices about the color mixing. I'm gonna do that eyebrow a little higher and that turn. Again, useful to measure. I'm glad I'm doing a smaller panel because that bigger panel would have slowed me down tonight because you have to, I would have had to move it up and down on the monitor to see different parts of the painting so there's some red in the shadow around the eye. I want to make sure that I get enough color in there to begin with. Um, because it's easier to, for it to go too dark without enough color in it. And then I get the outer edge of this nose. And this is where I get a little bit of the dimensionality where the nose transitions from dark to light. Um, you get a little more volume there. So I was saying when I paint paint shape to shape and I'm not really naming things, I'm really just focused on making sure that all the relative shapes are, um, are in the right place together. And then if I'm thinking more about the form and how it's turning in space and the anatomy, um, that's sort of a different mental exercise 
It also means that um, I had a teacher, Lori Madden, who said, and I'm sure lots of teachers have said this, paint what you know, not what you see, or you're doing actually a combination of both, is that you're painting both what you see, but also what you know. And I always found is the more you know, the more you see. And I know it sounds like I'm talking gibberish, and I usually am, but this, I know what I'm talking about. It's the idea that um, your knowledge of what it is you're painting is extremely important um, when you're painting it, because that brings, uh, allows you to do things and paint with a greater understanding and accuracy if you know what it is. I still sound like I'm talking gibberish. Um, your knowledge makes you a more effective uh, drawer or painter because you know more about what it is. Just text me if you think if I'm sounding too crazy here. Um, and I'm going for the upper lip. But that's to say it's always worth learning more about the anatomy and the forms that you and the thing that you're painting to be able to be an effective painter. Here I'm doing, putting, getting a little bit of purple colors in the lips. I don't think it is that purple, but I'm liking the way it looks. And then there's the dark part of the lip I can go with the dioxazine purple in there if I really want it to be punchy um, or I can come in with a little bit of the alizarin permanent. I do know that uh, this far side of the lips are darker and that will help it turn into space so you have a plane that's facing down but it's more kind of going back in space this way and then another plane that's going back in space that way. And by separating the colors between the two, it's helpful to lead the eye to understand that they're in two different directions. And again, I have this highlight that's right along the upper part of the lip. And then this is actually lighter than what I painted it. I can just, and maybe a little yellower, I can just go over it with a lighter colored paint and a more yellow color orange here orange anybody okay uh, so I'm hoping some of these forms are starting to read now I have the outer edge of the nose that will be helpful to get that outer edge to, to look like it's going pointing towards the side and there's actually some very narrow um, color and value changes there that really help point it more sideways and don't have the shape of the nostril quite right yet there's a point that comes down and then it comes back down and then it goes up a little bit better and then we have the outer flange of the nostril is actually coming a little bit lower and then has the shadow underneath that and that's very red and then very quickly next to that it gets a lot lighter pinker yellow add a little yellow there oh, too yellow again what i said about adjusting like it's all about adjusting what you put down until it starts to look right Okay, I'm just gonna look. Uh, we have five people with us right now. I got two thumbs up. Woo! -hoo. And next time I'll do a little bit of planning so I can announce this in advance. I just didn't feel so confident yet about um, what I was able to do tonight. So I didn't feel like I um, needed to have the whole world in watching my mistakes. But uh, this is going okay. No major technical difficulty except for the wrong size panel in the beginning.
Um, I have tons of panels in my basement there. If anyone wants a cheap deal on panels, Speedball, also known as Mona Lisa panels, are extremely inexpensive on Dick Blick. And they're very inexpensive, but they're also, the surface is kind of strange. The surface of the panels are, while they have a texture to them, they're very slick. And I've even done, tried to paint on them and the painting wouldn't stay on the surface. Every brush stroke I put down uh, would come up, um, would pull paint up off the panel. And then I got so frustrated, I decided I was gonna try to wipe the paint off the panel and all of the paint came off the panel. There was not a trace of paint left on it. That's how slick it was. It was so slick that not any of the paint absorbed into the panel. But, um, and then I was gonna return all those panels that I bought. And then I, um, I decided I was just gonna buy um, a little tub of gesso and try gessoing it and see if I liked it. And um, after doing several paintings of various um, passes of gesso, gesso sanded down or just straight gesso or two coats of gesso, um, I found that just one quick pass of gesso was the right amount for me with um, the various um, stiffness of brushes that I use. And so I have all these panels downstairs, but I only um, have a few of them prepared at a time. So I have maybe, I want to say 200 panels, close to 200 panels, because they're also cheaper if you buy them in bulk meaning 10 at a time. And so I have a bunch of sizes that I've purchased, uh, various sizes. To give you an idea of the pricing, uh, any of you have ever used ampersand panels? A, an eight by 10 panel at um, full cost, meaning they, they often discount them, but the full cost is about nine or $10 for a panel. And then sometimes you can find them discounted to about $7 a panel or so. Um, so when a panel's, when the painting service starts to get into a certain price range, and since I do a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, <laughs> I must have said something that sounded like, hey Siri, because my um, my iPad started talking to me um, about panel pricing. <laughs> Very funny. Um, uh, I totally lost my train of thought. <laughs> okay, so um, sorry, Siri. Um, okay, so I was saying there about um, about the cost of panels. When the cost of panels are too much, and I'm doing a lot of portrait sketching then it just feels like, it just makes me nervous that I'm burning through a lot of money just to do a, a quick sketch. When I first started using the app Sketchy and I was doing a sketch a day and I was first doing it on paper and then on panels, um, paying seven or eight dollars a panel just, um, just to do a quick sketch was too much. And so the price of these, um, of these Mona Lisa panels, uh, to give you an example, an eight by 10, when I first started buying them, if you could buy 10 at a time, were $1.25 a panel. And that is my sweet spot there. Uh, paying about a dollar a panel to do a quick sketch. I, I could paint with a bandit and not worry about the cost of the panels. And now it just takes a quick cut of gesso and off to the races, it's the perfect, um, it's the perfect surface for how I paint. If it has enough absorption and enough tooth to it, those are two separate things, the tooth and the absorption. Um, tooth, for people who don't know, is really the, the uh, texture, the surface, um, it's almost like a surface uh, friction 
that you get when you rub the brush against it. Um, when the tooth is about right, it's almost like it has a little bit of bite to it. And the absorption is the amount of moisture that sinks into, can sink into the surface. So the gesso actually provides both tooth and absorption. Gesso is a, a kind of acrylic paint that um, they must add lanolin or something, some marble dust or something to it that um, that gives it that texture. I think it's probably marble dust. And that gives it the tooth and then there may be something like chalk or something in it that um, gives it the absorption. And then it's a, um, it's, a, it's a vinyl paint essentially. It's like acrylics that are made out of vinyl. And okay, so I've got something a little bit wrong about the hairline there that I can work on, but it's making her face feel a little bit too broad and needs adjusting. So there's some of the hair that's coming out further and then her hairline is then softer up here and then going up. Okay, that looks a little bit better. I just need to paint it the right value. So it's a darkish greenish color, very close to being neutral, so not a whole lot of color. And then the hair comes out over the ear. I, um, I can be a little bit sloppy here in this part. I, going to want the extremities of her face to be softer so that they look like they're receding in space. Um, it also um, gives me an opportunity to do have effects that um, oil paints do very well, which is kind of combination of soft and hard edges. And it's something I actually don't do enough, and I want to find excuses to do it more in my painting, is to have places where the edges are very, very soft, almost like a photograph where it goes, um, has parts of the photo that are way out of focus. Uh, I did a painting recently called Rainbow Girl. I don't know if you can um, look up that painting on my Instagram account, or um, did I put anything on YouTube yet? I did shoot a um, time lapse of it, but I haven't posted it yet. But in a Rainbow Girl, and from the photo, the photo had her face in sharp focus and then had the background um, uh, bouquet or um, out of focus where the, the lights in the, in the background, when they say bouquet, had that kind of um, like nice roundish shapes but very soft edges. And so I painted it that way. And so the effect was having her face so sharp and some of the details in her face really sharp, but having the, the background so soft um, really gave, it was a really a nice effect. Um, even though it was the effect in the photo, having, bringing that effect forward in the painting was um, really, um, really made for a beautiful painting. And so I do want to find excuses to, to do that more. It's a little distracting when I look at my monitor from my, um, from my other account where I can actually see the text. Um, I can't see your comments for some reason on, um, on my phone. It says show live chat messages, but it doesn't seem to do it. Um, but, but I can see all your chat messages on my other account. So on my big monitor, it's easier for me to read. Do you have any questions? Anyone have any questions out there? Um, let me just look through. Maybe you have asked a question and I've missed it. Um, Kimberly says, those are hard to get in for me, but I'm not sure. Someone else, oh, Kimberly also said, slow down. Obviously I'm speeding when I'm painting. Um, smiles. But that wasn't a, a question question that needed to be answered, more rhetorical. Okay, so I'm going to keep on going. Um, this will be re reposted in some form on my channel, uh, YouTube, uh, 
post it sometime after um, after the live session so that you can go back and or people who missed it can go and watch it but they can't participate obviously because it's already happened unless they have a time machine um, so remember what I said the chin being greener so I'm trying to keep that idea that in the shadows here try to keep a little bit of green uh, mixed with the blacks um, and I haven't really defined whether the light source is warm or cool generally you want to um, set uh, have a temperature in mind whether it's a cool light with a warm shadow or a warm light with a cool shadow right now the light looks kind of fairly neutral and the shadow looks neutral although there's li little bits of green coming in you can see in the photo so if the shadows are greenish then the lights kind of um, would make the light kind of reddish so let's go with a warm light and a cool shadow. And I can exaggerate that a little bit. And the effect that will have is to make the light feel stronger. Um, and that's by exaggerating the how, the how warm the colors are on the light side of the face. When I say warm, meaning uh, higher chroma and more towards orange than they actually are in the photo and then that helps create that sense of warmth and you'll and a lot of impressionist painters will use that idea they'll paint light the light areas very um, bright yellow or orange even though um, they may look neutral with the bare eye on the scene if they shift those colors in the painting it that change it's often called temperature of color often makes the you can makes it feel like you can feel the warmth of those colors coming through and there's other painters that want it to feel closer to what they're seeing and will paint uh, overall grayer closer to the visible color and then you won't have that feeling of warmth but you will have a scene that looks more realistic. That's the, the right term in that case. It's closer to, I, want, I don't want to say a photograph, but it's closer to your, visib, your visible experience of the scene. Not, not an exaggeration or color invention to get a certain um, color effect experience so to give an example of a painter who worked in this way is um, Joaquin Soroya he's a Spanish impressionist would exaggerate those color differences and when you look at his paintings you, it's almost like you have a shock of, of daylight or a shock of the cool ocean breeze because of the effect that his color his relatives colors had on the the feeling of the light and if you have the ability to look up Soroya and you're not familiar with his work um, you will be doing yourself a great favor by googling it because um, he is probably one of the most influential painters of the 19th and early 20th century on on painters today, um, Joaquin Soroya and uh, John Singer Sargent um, are really the two. Uh, and if you can throw in Anders Zorn into that bunch, then you have the the trinity of alla prima painters that have had the most effect on alla prima painters, modern alla prima painters because of their facility of painting and just the the modern uh, approach to their to their paintwork compared to the academic painting styles of that same period so right there i'm painting so it's useful to think in dimension i'm painting the underside of that ear 
And if I get it just right, where the light side is a little bit lower on this side and then coming up, then you really do start to feel that the dimension of the ear there. And if I can get a little bit of red that goes um, is sharp and then goes out of focus, then um, it really does look like it is moving back in space very quickly. Um, the same with the uh, uh, upper side of the ear. Now I really am thinking about it as spatially. Here's the back tip of the ear and then it moves forward in space like that. Like I said, when I can start to visualize it in my brain as I'm painting it, then um, I can get it to more effectively move forward and back in space. So if I get the dark here, where the shadow is underneath that and can be a little bit punchier. I can even go um, a little more intensity in the color of the red there. That's the um, inside shadow inside the ear and then there's the outer part of the ledge of the ear there. And when all I'm missing now to make the ear feel like it has enough definition is a little bit of that shadow that's going too dark there, but shadow that's inside the ear. And let me redefine the lights there. This all, this, this is the part of the paint that I feel is like most exciting for me is when you can have something that looks like whole brush strokes and it defines really well the thing that you're painting and it looks like it was all done very quickly and effortlessly. I love that, even if it wasn't effortless. I just love the look of that. Um, and the more I can get of that in a painting, the better. That is all looking very good. Um, I just do you want to do a little bit of correction on the edge of that ear so that it looks a little bit closer to where it is in the photo? I lost that edge. Then let's see if I can get that back here. Too dark. See, it's not effortless. Okay. So let me just evaluate a little bit. Um, just want a little bit of that light coming up along this edge and down. Okay, good. Feels like an earlobe I can grab. And just along the very edge of her cheek or jaw is a ref almost like a reflected light that it's saying that there's a light that's coming straight from the side and hitting the side of her her cheek and that's also bringing in some lights in here So I am going to correct some of the paint that I have here because I can see that it's off a little bit as I evaluate the photo. It's all, this is all an adjustment game here. And the nose does come out a little bit further than when I have it. I don't know if, if you, you can't see my palette, but it's, I'm going to take a dip here to show you. It's just all kind of a big mess, pools of color. And I'm just going in and poking at different different colors kind of randomly as I as I see a color that is close to what I want and I can go in and adjust it. Um, I can't quite get this back to where it was there. Um, let's get in a little closer. So, and away we go. I'm gonna, okay, I needed to adjust that. I think the bridge 
There's a little green transition here. And we need to correct the space in her lips a little. And the far edge. Measure. about right and I kind of wasn't paying attention to some of these shapes that they're not quite placed right and I do want to get a sense of realism and it helps to get some of the um, things in the right place the right color the right value the right shape not dark enough on that side of the face, so I need to get a little black involved. Really knock, maybe push that um, value back. And that will help get a sense of turn of the, of the far side of the jaw. Really does go much darker. I can just actually paint um, that dark into it that's and paint that more softly because it really does kind of blend in there is a harder line right around here that's looking better okay so I want to get that other eye in before I get too far along and I need it in the right place so I want to get that corner landmark the tear duct the right height painted it but nothing was on the brush okay and the right distance this way I did um, watch a demonstration of an artist named Mark Tennant and he is a fairly known figurative painter and in his demo he spent maybe two hours measuring all the landmarks in the figure um, in very light pencil <laughs> before he started painting. And I think it was a surprise to most people because his paintings look very, um, have kind of a spontaneous look to them. And uh, there was nothing spontaneous about his demonstration. He was really talking about every anatomical um, landmark that you can see and talked about proportion and um, measured uh, before he even did the full drawing of of the subject that, of the model that he was painting he did a little smaller version on the piece of paper first um, and then uh, once he got all that set with all the all the pieces that he wanted to paint that he um, only then did he start doing the the drawing and the measuring of the full version. Um, like I said, all that took a couple of hours to do. And then the painting itself, or it was, in this case, it was a charcoal drawing. I think that only took about a half hour to do. And uh, it was kind of interesting because um, the way he blended the colors where it was, uh, it was soft charcoal that he did the dark area and the light area, and then he just took the heel of his hand and just smeared it together to do the transition of the the values from from the light to the to the dark in just one pass, and it just all came together just that one movement, <laughs> and I think it just sh shocked everybody because it was like uh, nothing was happening, nothing was happening. It didn't look like the way it was going to look, and he just made this one move. This was the, the money move that um, that brought the whole thing together, and there was this sort of like this um, gasp in the in the audience. Um, it was a it was really a it was at Zoll Studio. It was a packed house. There was maybe um, I'm glad the fire marshal wasn't there because it was about. Uh, almost 150 people in a room that's um, you probably shouldn't have more than 50 people in and people were um, in chairs and standing around the back but anyway so there was this gasp as 
he did this one thing and I'm sure he does enough demos that it's uh it's part of the show you know that um he knows that um that's the part that's going to get the reaction and uh but it was it was that part was fun to watch but having to sit through two hours of um of measuring and very light um charcoal drawing that you can't even barely see i think someone asked him if he could draw it a little darker <laughs> so that we could see what he was doing and he said well if i make it too dark then um then you're going to see the all those lines in the finished work and the point is to have all that work done very lightly so that it doesn't um, show up and so we were just sitting there we we could see him measuring and see him talking about measuring but we couldn't actually see um and plus if you were sitting in the back you could you couldn't see that much you couldn't actually see the the drawing on paper um at that at that point in the drawing it wasn't until he got a little bit further in that he was making more definite finished marks so you could see those anyway again take a look at look up mark Tennant if you're curious about his work um he works in a way it's kind of a mixture of contemporary and um and traditional um but then again i think when people thought of his work that they wouldn't have imagined that he would have be spending so much time on the pure academic part of of the drawing but that in a way was the secret to his results is that when you do all that preliminary work of measuring um, and getting everything in the right place and have the knowledge of anatomy and proportion when you finally get to do the actual um, finished marks, then you have the confidence to put it down very quickly and cleanly. Um, but it did take a lot of time to get there. Okay. I starting to see this come together. Um, okay. I see a question. I don't know how long ago it was asked, but, um, did you go to art school? So yes, I, um, First, I went to engineering school, and I just figured out um, after getting the degree and a couple years out of school, I began to understand that I wasn't an engineer, just because you have an engineering degree. It was it was actually during a period where it was very difficult to get work in engineering, at least for me. I didn't have the right grades and um, was not the right candidate for what most companies were looking for and then um, but I really really felt deep down that I wasn't really suited for an engineering I was more of an artist and wanted to draw and paint so I applied to Art Center College of Design in Pasadena California First, to get into the school, I took night classes to build up a portfolio that then I could use that portfolio to apply to the school. And my portfolio was good enough and they accepted me. And so I ended up getting a Bachelor's of Fine Art in Illustration and took quite a number of graphic design classes, which was a, a very good thing in the end because when I moved to New York and was trying to get illustration work, that there was so much more work doing uh, freelance graphic design than any kind of illustration that I could get. And um, in the end, I did pick up a bit of illustration. It was never enough to pay the rent, but I was doing a a monthly spot for Condé Nast Traveler magazine. I picked up. Uh, quite a bit of work with Esquire magazine, Food and Wine, and um, Travel and Leisure magazine, sort of all the food and travel magazines I have done at least a few illustrations for. Um, the Condé Nast Traveler magazine, I did that monthly spot for over a two to three year period of time. It was for a hotel review section that they had that they wanted a uh, painted uh, sort of how do you 
to say it, a uh, plant, like more like a uh, a la prima painting version of the hotel that was the was the subject was the was the featured hotel that they were reviewing and they would send me photos of that so anyway but to get back to the school question art center college of design i felt was the perfect place to be i took their illustration major which is if you really wanted to learn to draw and paint that was the major to take the fine art major was less about drawing and painting and more about um sort of the conceptual um contemporary fine art and there was not a whole lot of emphasis on drawing and painting skills it was more about um, developing pieces that would work in the in the contemporary gallery system and so um, but illustration was all about learning uh, how to draw and paint and how to use different kinds of media and experimenting with different styles of um, illustration. It's the point where a lot of students actually developed a style that they would use to market themselves um, either as an editorial illustrator or advertising illustration. And during that time I was just really focused in learning how to draw and paint. And so I didn't really develop a style except to say that it was a uh, style that was based on traditional realism and fairly painterly and that's still pretty much how I paint today but have a little more skill than than I did back then I think I pretty much um, answered that I think feel free to ask more questions if you want I do have a small audience here of six people according to my phone and according to my uh, my other account, I can I can do I can see those. Oh, so cool. Okay, so um, Malvintius said, "Oh, so cool," and then he asked the question. Um, I assume that he, um, that you had just come into the channel and are we're seeing the painting. Um, you are seeing it kind of at an angle, obviously. The, the photo is very distorted um, from the parallax view of the camera lens. And then the painting is also not very, a little bit distorted. I don't know to what degree I can change the, the angle or edit once I get the, the, um, the reposted footage from YouTube. They do have some editing tools, but I think that will be mostly for trimming the video or changing the color a little bit. Um, but I, I'm not sure. I do, I work in Adobe Premiere to do the post-production of my videos and I shoot the time lapse at an angle. Um, pretty much the angle that I'm shooting this at. And then in Adobe Premiere, I use a tool called Corner Pin, and I straighten out all the corners so that it looks like it's uh, the camera is actually more like straight on and that there's no distortion in the, there's no distortion of the painting, essentially. I'm re, I'm adjusting it so it looks closer to the right size in proportion to the actual painting. I don't think I'm going to be able to do that um, with this video, but that's okay. It's more about um, the demo itself than the than the angle. Okay, so let me see where I am right now. I have most of her face in. The background here is going to go mostly dark. And then her neckline drops down below the bottom here. So I have it here. So I'm going to try to quickly work to put in the rest of the, the background colors and some of the values so that I'm not, um, so I am able to put in the correct values in the, in the side of the face. That side of the face is very dark. 
and unless I've established the color, the values around it, the even darker darks that are in the, the hair, it's a little hard to, to get that to read properly. A little bit of the wrong colors in here in the neck. I need kind of a warm neutral color and then that shifts to green. Then I have a highlight here where the light is hitting more directly. And the neck. And do a little more measuring. And then, yes, the hair comes down into here. I can really take a lot of liberty with the hair because um, no one's going to see the photo. Well, that's not true. I post, usually I post the photo with some of these videos, so you can compare it to the photo, but um, the hair can be a place where you can really show the brushwork. It doesn't have to be exact. You can be a lot looser and liberal with it, and that can help give the painting uh, more energy. Um, especially doing things like leaving uh, patches of the panel bare, which I haven't decided I'm going to do here yet or not. Um, I'm going to use a little bit of bright yellow, even though that looks too yellow. But maybe orange to get a little more color in here. Highlight. So then I can introduce color into the highlights of her hair. And that'll give it a a little more life too. Okay. Here's where I need to do some major adjusting too. Because I, while I've been talking, I haven't been paying a whole lot of attention to whether things were painted in the right place. And there are some parts of her face that just aren't reading right yet. Um, Melvin, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name, but I'm going to try. Melvin Atias says, I'm from Chile, and here you cannot enter by portfolio to art schools just for an academic selection test. Um, yeah, so uh, no portfolio, you just, I don't know what that means, academic selection. I guess that means... Um, based on your academic grades or your academic testing, not on your art skill. That seems like that's kind of strange because it seems like your success at an art school is based on a level of skill that you have and your willingness to work hard towards improving that. And the academic test doesn't, doesn't usually show that. Um, but that's Chile. I'm sure there are some great artists in Chile, but I'm not sure that the schools are really producing that well. I, are you at, um, are you in art school right now in Chile? In Santiago, maybe? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I might get an answer soon. No, there's a little bit of delay on... I can see on the screen that I have open that, uh, let me see, there's uh, about a 10 second delay, it looks like. So if you ask a question, type a question, I'll maybe get it 10 seconds after <laughs> you send it. And if I ask you something, you'll hear it about 10 seconds after I ask it. Okay, so there is some something off about the jawline, and here this isn't moving fast enough in space, and I really do got to have the eyes connecting uh, a little bit better. So there's this uh, slant to her, to the direction of her eyes into the ear, and I have that off just a little bit. So when I start to correct some of these things, the face will start to pull together a little bit better. 
um, also have some values off here in the nose. What I'm going to do is, um, I have a lot of paint on my palette now, and I don't have enough of some colors, so that's making it very difficult for me to mix the colors that I want. And if I am disciplined, then I will stop and put out the colors that I need and clear my palette instead of um, instead of suffering. Okay, where's my white? Maybe you're here somewhere. I threw a bunch of books on top of my colors. Uh, excuse me. Oh, I'm diving underneath my palette. Okay. And I'm back. So I've got to put out more white if I'm able to get some clean white color. Um, and I cleared off my palette so I'm able to mix a little bit better. There's some artists that only use a palette knife when they're mixing and they wipe their palette knife off each time so they don't contaminate their um, piles of color. That's not me. I'm not um, anal enough for that. Um, and Angela knows who works with me that I'm not a neat freak. So my palette is, it gets to be a real mess. And those piles of colors get to have all kinds of other colors stuck in them. And uh, there we go. Now I am, and I'm doing a lot more squinting now so I can start to see where things are off. And as I make those adjustments, I'm trying to keep, use the large brush if I can, because that is going to help me. And I'm finding that there's areas um, on this panel that aren't really grabbing the paint well enough. And that's because I may be using too stiff a brush at this point for the amount of paint that's down. And I may have to shift to a soft, little bit softer brush to get the panel to um, hold on to more of the paint. Um, but it's doing an okay job right now, so I'm just gonna keep on going. And I get a little bit of orange with the black in here. So it's not really having a hard time getting that, um, the paint, the palette to accept the paint. Um, that's all a balancing act. It took me a long time of experimenting to get the feel of having the right surface, the right brush stiffness, um, just getting all those sort of variables under my belt so that I wasn't fighting it so much. I um, spent years struggling with doing just what I'm doing now is painting um, gestural um, head studies, gestural portraits. Um, and a lot of times I was, it was just because I was not understanding the materials well enough to feel like I had enough control um, to do exactly what I wanted. And then it really took painting um, in my new studio, which is a, my computer desk with good lighting and experimenting with the surfaces and the brushes and some of the materials to be able to have that greater sense of control. Each thing that you have, the paint, the paintbrush, the surface, the lighting, the subject that you're painting from, in my case, it's a computer monitor. All those things are variables that will affect the outcome of the painting. And unless you really have control over those variables, you're going to have a hard time um, getting consistent results. And that's, um, that's what I found. I was really struggling. Um, currently, oh, so uh, Malvin T.S. asks another question. Cur or she currently work painting portraits. Do you live uh, off of art? Sorry for my bad English. 
U U. Um, so I, while I'm starting to get more and more commissions as I have built up my social media presence, I work a full-time job as a, uh, as a web designer, web developer, and that, um, and my wife also works and, uh, the combination of us working pays our bills. And whenever money that I make off of, um, off of commissions first goes to pay, pay for my art materials. So in pa in the past, I've, for the most part of broken even, I think more lately I'm doing a little bit better where I'm able to save some of that money, um, use it towards the kids' education. And um, we'll see where this goes. I don't plan on quitting my day job um, and can do both. Right now I am producing on average about six or seven head studies or portraits a month and can do that on top of my full-time job and other responsibilities of the household. And um, so I am, if I get a lot more portrait work, then I'm gonna continue to do that um, the way I'm doing it now, just after hours and on weekends. And so I'm really trying to get um, these forms to read properly and turn in space properly. So this, um, this top and I'm trying to do it as subtly as it is in the photo, so it kind of reads the same way. And, um, but make sure that it's still reading so those forms do turn in space. And similar here with the upper eyelid, I have the edge of this too dark, so while it's turning, it's just reading um, too differently than the photo. So I have to be a little more careful with the colors and the values there. I need them to be fairly subtle. Um, but I do want to get those that turn in space. So here then goes up into the temple and there's a little bit darker area. And this is what I get into like paint what you know. Like you, if you know where these forms turn in space, um, you make sure that you can look for them in the photograph so that it, um, so that you can reproduce that same idea. So again, here is there's a turn in the in the forehead here, just where I'm putting this highlight, and this highlight is going to help that turn. Again, I want to try to put it in as subtly as it is there. Throwing me off a lot is the highlight, um, is the light side of this nose I, I kind of have in the wrong place. I don't have it far over enough. And so I need to adjust that so enough of this is reading correctly so that I get the sense of um, where I am and it starts to feel real. And again, there's this light area, the the bone structure of the nose is catching the highlight and then it makes a turn and it's very subtle, the change here, but it is a change. And then as it turns a corner again and then meets up with the cheek, I forget what this area is called, but there is sort of the softer tissue along the side of the nose that has a um, very specific shape to it. And then there's the cheek here that it meets, that it runs into. And all of this is just trying to get that feel of the anatomy that's there so that those planes in the face start to read correctly and that it starts to feel like flesh and not just a bunch of paint on the surface. And so I think we are starting to get some of that. I think I need to make some correction to the shapes in the eyes so that 
it actually is reading as an eye, the white of the eye, and that it's reading the right size for her face. So just make some minor corrections here to really get it to read properly. And I have her pupil too, too low. So I'm going to adjust that if I can. And then I'm going to put in that highlight again. Remember what I said that the light going through the lens of the eye is lighting the lower part of the iris. So if I can get in a little bit lighter there, even exaggerate a little bit, um, sort of get those puppy dog eye things going, then that's going to help the eye read properly. And you've got to get a, the right shape again to the iris for it to, to read. And then I have not giving her enough white of the eye there. So it's making her eye look a little bit too small. And okay. That's starting to read a little bit better. I have lost my tear duct, so I can reestablish that. I'm not sure if this eye has moved around from all the adjusting, so I'm just remeasuring. Um, it's actually pretty close, so I'm not going to worry about it so much. But um, what I don't have working yet is the actual the eye, the white of the eye turning away in space yet. Um, there is going to be some radiation between the part of the eye that's right against the, the iris. Yeah, remember my words. And where it goes into the tear duct, it's actually, it's got to get a little bit darker in values. So that feels like it's um, moving back in space so that eye actually feels round. And that's a little bit better. Um, let's see if I can get the right angle of this lower part of the lid that's facing up. Again, I don't have the words for some of these things. I just know um, what I want them to do. I'm not one of those kids that have met that have learned the word to every part of the anatomy. I mean, I know things like the zagom, zagomatic arch. I don't even know, boy, I don't even know if I'm saying that right right now. My brain is, is such in visual mode. Zygomatic arch, yes. Um, but, um, but I just have kind of a map in my head now of everything, the shapes that I usually see. And that's almost more important than knowing the name of everything because you're not going to have labels on it when you're when you put it up on the wall. You just it just needs to look right. There. Okay. And so now I'm just adjusting some of the shapes around the eye so that those forms are turning the right amount. And as I um, correct those, they'll just feel more like what they're supposed to be. This eyebrow is no longer feeling like an eyebrow. Um, I don't have the values right. And just needs to be a little softer here. I try not to do too much blending. It starts to have kind of a weird uh, cheesy look if you blend too much and part of the beauty of all of Prima painting is the is being able to see the brushwork 
So it's <clears throat> it's worthwhile spending the time trying to get some paint on the brush with each brush stroke. You'll see that when I put down a brush stroke, a lot of times I'm going two or three strokes at a time, but I try to make sure that there is enough paint there to support it. And it's, we're almost, uh, we're about a little over an hour and a half into this. I probably will paint for another hour or so. So you guys can decide how much you want to stick with me on this. Um, but I will just keep on painting regardless. And um, I should be able to finish the painting, I think, in that time period. Just to give you an idea, I usually spend about eight hours on a painting, but I'm treating this more like a sketch. So painting two and a half hours is enough to get to where I want to go. And I'm not going to worry about likeness quite as much, but I think that the likeness will probably be pretty close because I did a fair amount of measuring. But, <clears throat> but it's spending the time going back and forth with the values and slight adjustments and the features to really get the likeness to work. I just want more sort of the effect of the paint to be working properly um, for the sketch. Um, so this is, there's just a little bit of blue color on the, on the top part of that um, lid there. What I get, and it gets even lighter. So I may come in with a little bit of white. I really want to get that sense of light reflecting around in there. Make a little more adjustment to her pupil because it does come further out and does get lighter right in there. Lovely. Okay. And same coming up on the side. There's a little bit harder edge to the outer edge of the pupil. Uh, I want to say pupil, the outer edge of the iris right there. And if I can get the lashes to read as not just a dark shape, but actually coming out away from the lid, that will help. And still have a few people here with me, which is good. So when I post it, um, the final version it won't, won't look like I'm just painted all alone, but that's okay. Um, the way I kind of imagine this is as I, um, as I do more of these, I'll, I'll announce it further in advance and so more people can join me and as they see the, the posted live um, videos, they'll um, be more encouraged, I hope, if they like what they see, to, to sit in. Oh, I like the way that looks. Okay. Because it does look like it's reading properly in, in space there. Okay. So we've got a few things that are still off, or at least off enough that it, they bother me. There's some, measure, some measurements that are a little bit off here in the hairline that um, become important because if the shape of her head and her face aren't right, then um, it doesn't feel doesn't feel real, doesn't feel right. And so even more than the features in the interior of the face it, are the things like the jawline, um, getting those to read properly, turning right into space really help with getting the sense of 
of likeness and uh, readability. And I think sometimes I have a hard time talking while I'm doing this because my brain wants to shift into visual mode and not in language mode. So I'm trying my best <laughs> to keep on talking. Hopefully you're getting enough out of watching, just watching me paint and not so much out of what I'm saying. Okay, and I'm missing the dark underneath her jaw. It's not very pronounced till it gets to closer to the chin. Sort of a reddish, orange, purple, something. And this is also off here, the far side of her, her chin. Made it too, a little bit too narrow. So again, this is just all about comparing and adjusting, and it doesn't have to be tight, just as long as relative color and value are in about the right place and it will start to read. It can be very painterly and cannot and the breaststrokes don't necessarily have to follow the form, but if everything's in the right place, the whole thing kind of snaps together. And the closer I get to it matching, having things in the right, the right size, the right place, the right value, the, what was I going to say? then the, the, the more I am able to see how um, the painting is off from the photo and can make um, finer adjustments. And, and that's the place where I'm getting to right now, being able to make some of those finer adjustments. Um, darker, more orange. I can squint and look back and forth between the photo and the painting, and I can see very quickly then um, where, it, where it differs. For example, the nostril is not quite in the right place yet. It's just a, a little bit higher, a little bit longer. And so the flange, Two, it's not coming down low enough. Getting all those things, very subtle adjustments means that they read correctly in space. And I don't have that, the edge of the nostril is catching a little bit of light and it's kind of a sharp has a lot of sharpness compared to some of the forms around it. So I want to try to maintain some of that. Uh, totally wrong color on the brush. Okay. Too dark. You don't have to be very exact initially, as long as you have a way of adjusting Oil paint is a very forgiving medium. You can do a lot of adjusting. There's other mediums like um, like watercolor can be um, a lot of, depending on how you work, um, you may need to be a lot more exact. Okay, just putting in her nose ring now. That's just with a few dark marks. And then on top of that, I'll put some 
very light mark, so it'll feel metallic. So you get the shape of her um, outer edge of her nose a little bit better. And there's just this, this very subtle shadow here. Getting that in is kind of important because it really does help lift that nose ring off of the surface of her nose. Let's see if I can keep the same brush for doing the highlight on the nose ring. This feels like, um, try not to be too, what's the word, gimmicky with those marks because then it just looks, starts to look, um, Look, it can look very cheesy if you're not careful, if you exaggerate some of those things too much. Um, but you do need to get enough contrast in those for it to read properly. And uh, see how it does start to look like it's separating properly. And I have a little bit of a accent there along the edge of the nose and a little bit of darker orange color coming in underneath here so like I said just sort of looking comparing finding those kind of color and value differences and putting them in and that's where some of the magic um, starts to happen where things just start to look like you can grab them takes a while to get there, um, but those reds a little bit too exaggerated. I haven't really used the quinacridone red so much, which is a very cool pink red, um, but I'm putting, going to try to get a little bit in here just for a little bit of variation of color. I'm going to have to reestablish that highlight because I, it's losing it a little bit there. Got it really nice and thick, and I'm just reshaping it so that it's in the right place, in the right shape. Okay. Do you have an artist family that will encourage you to paint? Okay, so I, have, uh, I don't know if all of you can see everyone else's questions. So, um, Melvinitius, I really am probably butchering your name. Uh, Melvinitius, Melvinitius, there you go. Do you have family that will encourage you to paint? It's funny that you should ask that because, um, well, my mom's a sculptor and my sister does... Uh, does pen and ink drawings and large paper mache sculpture. And there was recently a documentary that was done about my sister. It was about her artwork, but it was also about her mental illness, her battle with mental illness. And uh, that documentary is called uh, Heaven is a Traffic Jam on the 405. And last month it won in the short documentary category, it won the Oscar for documentary short, um, the film about her. So she's the best actress in a short documentary. And uh, so she's an artist, my mom's an artist. And, um, and so, yes, I guess I am encouraged to paint um, as long as um, I don't quit my day job, I think. Um, I can paint as much as um, I want sometimes. I think I would just, um, if I'm painting what I want and how I want, I could just paint endlessly all the time. But, um, but I, I think that I do have to balance that with a lot of other things. So at some point I do have to stop. But um, trying to get this chin to read. And 
there's a little bit of a light edge again at the bottom of that chin. This is light reflecting around from the hair back in to her chin. And I need these values um, here to be right for I'm losing the credibility of her far cheek. That's a good word, credibility. Um, believability, something where it's not reading properly. So I need to keep on making some of these adjustments until it does read right. I think I have that side of her lip a little bit too high so I can come in with a highlight and trim it and bring the separation between her lips a little bit lower. I'm glad you guys are sticking with me because uh, not sure this is that interesting to watch, probably more interesting to do. As a punishment, I may have, you have, may have to make me watch all of you guys paint so that I will have to suffer the same. Okay. You know, I'm just kidding there. Let's see how many people decide to watch after this is reposted, though. I can follow my YouTube analytics to see how that does. Oh, I like that. Um, the look of that. If I get the darks here underneath the nose right, that'll read a lot better. Keep on going, adjusting those values, because that's going to be the key here. Okay, and I have a little bit too much there. I'm going to re- Establish that highlight again. I said it was just a little bit in the wrong place. And that's the placement of that highlight is really important to describing the shape of the nose. Highlights tend to be where things turn in, in space. It's sort of like where the where the flesh turns. Usually there's a highlight where the flesh is um, harder and smoother, like the bone or the tip of the nose, and where things turn. And where something turns, it tends to catch more light, just kind of like a mirror that's turning, well, or a wide-angle lens that's pulling in more light from different directions. And, okay, that's looking... Got something a little off here still, just so I can back up and look. Just small um, distances sometimes in uh, places where there's detail can make a big difference in the look of something, especially if it's turning away from you in space and it's off by a millimeter or two, can really look wrong. <laughs> but it's such a small distance, and that's where having... Um, Making those finer adjustments really does make a big difference. Um, so I can see that the, the septum of the nose is not wide enough. I think that's the right word, septum, the center part. Like I told you, I don't remember anatomy names that well. Sometimes I have this little fear if I'm ever hired to be a teacher, they're going to find out that I don't know the name of anything. And they're going to go, why did we hire this guy? He doesn't even know what to call the thing, you know. The thing below the thing. You know, 
what's the name of the part of the knee that floats out uh, to something that they're going to find out that I'm a fraud and they're going to put me in artist jail. Again, if I can just make these subtle adjustments, then hopefully the whole thing will start to come together. The big part is getting this whole part that I haven't uh, resolved yet working. I think everything else is pretty close. Although I do want to define something a little bit more about that eye. Okay, uh, just need to get that shape a little bit better. Okay, uh, let me see. Shapes in her forehead still aren't really well defined. And that's because the transition from light to dark is not really matching what's in the photo and not giving her forehead the right shape. It's like, I hate to be so literal and not really painting what I know here, but sometimes it's just a matter of copying what you see bit better. Okay, let's see if we can get the dark side of this space working a little bit better. Because um, I can make some of these adjustments endlessly and never really get there. Come on, just need this little highlight in there. Okay, la la la. Um, Still adjusting, sorry. Not really doing what I said I would do, but can't help it. Still want to adjust that nose ring a little and get that one secondary highlight in the right spot. And hit it again there. Okay. Uh, the bottom of her nose is not really feeling like it's pointed down. And I need to get that working. This part a little bit too light in here. I feel like overall there's parts of the shadow side that are just too light. Okay, now I need to adjust the, the jawline, the side of the face, and really get that dark dark properly, and that's where my black comes in handy. I don't know how people paint without black. It's a big controversy over whether you should have black in your palette or not, but I wouldn't know what to do without it. Okay. Really cut in there more. Okay. I still have a few people with me. That's okay. It's getting kind of late. I 
am going to paint for another half hour and then this will be done. Okay, still I have to get that turn in here, so I have to be brave enough to go darker. I have to go maybe 50 shades darker than I painted right now. And greener, apparently. Okay, that's starting to read a little bit better. And all of it darker. So one problem I have in the dark side of this is I've let there be a little bit too much white paint get into the shadow and that can have a, a negative influence on allowing the paint to look as dark as it needs to get. A little bit of white in there makes makes the shadow shade um, colors look too light. So I know a lot of artists that they are very careful not to let any white get into their shadow so that they don't have that problem. I am not that careful. So I do have that problem. Okay. And I have that problem here. This lid has to start off much darker on that side for it to read properly. And I do have missing my accents, which go much darker in the shadow. And if I can just get that continue to paint that a little bit darker. I'm going to be in good shape. The lid has to be darker here. Okay. We're starting to get a little traction. Good. And even that under, that part of the under lid that's facing up that catches the light I have that, again, I have that too dark, and it looks like I have it too high also. I have to just bring all of this down, lower, and even start again if I need to, repaint it, because it's not in the right place, and if it's not in the right place, it won't ever look right. That's a little bit better. Reestablish the pupil. I thought I was using black paint there and I'm using green paint. Okay, I have to find my black because I don't have any more black on my palette. Where are you? I think I was just at the end of my black and needed to open up the new box. That's blue. Mm -hmm. There's hopefully I have enough black in this tube. See, there's not very much left. Okay. 
Okay, I think I got enough blackout to finish this. Oh yeah, that's better. I have this, um, her hair that's coming right through the middle of her eye. Let's see if I can get that to feel right without messing everything up. And then her move her cheek further in so that the shape of her face feels right. I am now need to focus on putting down finishing strokes. Um, I'm not that far off. I have to make still some subtle adjustments to the shape of her face. Really need to move the chin down a little bit. Lots of white in that spot to overcome the other colors that I already have down. And again, Reestablish the darks underneath her chin. Because I'm not dark enough. And need to add a little bit, adjust again the shape of her jawline. The jawline is one thing that um, I usually end up spending a lot of time making subtle adjustments to because it just takes me a long time to get it to feel right. I don't know why, but I usually just naturally put it in the wrong place. Even if I've measured, I, my brain wants to put it somewhere else. So it just takes a while of moving it back and forth until I'm getting it into the right spot. And I have some black contaminating my paint there. <clears throat> um, let's work on the shape of the mouth a little bit. This needs to come out a little bit further. Then I'm missing this shape, this shadow that's underneath the corner of the mouth. And this is where you get familiar with certain shapes. Um, the shadow shape is the same on a lot of faces that I've painted and then usually comes all the way down into the jawline. Where's my Cranacridone red when I need it? It's here. The light is hitting the lower lip, but there's a small cast shadow from the upper lip on the lower lip. And then there's a transition from that shadow, and then there's the highlight. Then the far side of her lips are moving into shadow, so I don't have those have that quite dark enough yet. And then there's a much harder shadow that's underneath the lip. Have to get the separation of the lips right first. That's right there. redder or warmer and lots of dark green and then I have 
have to hit that shadow. Sort of a black, red combo. Seeing the whole shadow underneath her nose. Don't know how that happened. I think I remember painting it out, but I thought I painted it back in. Transitions to red. When I say red, a uh, shade of red. That blend starts to blend with the light of her of the upper lip and it's very green there and darker okay so now we have the values getting a little closer to the values in the photo or the monitor photo so that I'm I've already said this but I'm starting to get closer so it's starting to look like the actual flesh and I'm gonna paint for about 10 more minutes and then I'm gonna call it done I think or at least done for tonight. Who knows how I'll feel about it in the morning. Okay. green in her forehead here. The um, quality of the photo is not um, that great. It's a little bit pixelated, um, but I get some weird artifacting coloring going on and I kind of like that. So I'm going to just paint it in similar to what I see. Funky reds and greens fighting each other up here. Don't mind that too much. Make another adjustment to this jawline. And tighten up the jaw a little bit underneath. Oh, oh we did it. Okay, so I think some interesting things are happening here with the paint. I'm putting in some bold marks that kind of have a little bit of abstraction to them, and that's adding a lot of interest to the painting. So I am just going to go with that. See if I can keep some of those things um, going. And that is hopefully going to make the painting work overall is getting some of those more calligraphic marks going because I think this painting does need some of that. Um, really feel like that lip is not in a, doing the right thing yet. Really need that. There's like just a little bit of an opening to her lips and I really want that to read. You can actually see her teeth in that shadow of her mouth. So faint. And kind of a weird bluish color. And then I'm not painting her lower lip quite um, deep enough.
adjusting. to adjust the far side of her jaw and the shape of her lips and some of these little things that are off enough that it's affecting the her overall appearance just need to get those things right pull the bottom of her lip down a little bit there's some color there but then as the lip moves into shadow, there's a much stronger red color. And if I get that to read properly, then that's going to help. Okay. Mm. You need to hit that shadow. It's uh, black with a little yellow or something. starting to look a little bit better. Okay, and the shape of her lip is the upper lip comes down so I am painting rapidly to get there. Again, if I get some of those calligraphic marks in, that um, especially little flecks of light in the right place, that will help tremendously um, lift this painting up a little. I see a very nice blue-ish light on the upper lid that's in the shadow side. Those little color accents will um, create a lot more interest if I can get them the right value. Oops, got some black in there where I didn't want it. want to reestablish that very dark pupil in the shadow and then get the highlight in the eye. Okay. This seems so boring when I have people watching um, when I'm doing this all alone it never seems boring but I never um, think about it in terms of what is it like for to to how to watch it. So hopefully this isn't going to be um, 
one of those really bad experiments <laughs> that I regret later. Okay, so I want to continue trying to find places to get some of those blue-green marks in that, um, that add a lot more life to this. So right now I'm working back and forth between wanting it to look uh, closer to the photo but also then wanting to get a lot of more interesting color in it. That's what a uh, time limit does help with because if I don't get them in there now, I'm not going to put them in. Okay, and putting those sort of definitive hair shaped marks coming in. I think this is where I can do my best um, Bob Ross to do kind of these sort of happy strokes. She's got uh, this little eyelash that goes off here that's really interesting and then another strands of hair Okay, I made that a little crazy, so I'm going to knock it back. That's better. And uh, even though I said that uh, upper edge of her lid was too light, now I've made it non-existent, so I'm going to try to add it a little bit back in, including the dark edge of her tear duct. Okay, uh, it's 11 o'clock. I am going to do just one, about five more minutes of adjustment and then it's going to be done. I think this is, overall, it's not looking too bad. And I want to keep it loose, um, kind of out of focus in some spots. Um, but still um, making good reference to the, the underlying structure. Let's get some of those highlights in the hair. like a countdown clock or something so I can get myself to stop. there. Very close. I swear. Five. I am just push 
push the tip of that ear back a little bit, and then I think that might be the last thing that I do. Second to last thing I do. Okay, this is going to put my signature somewhere. Okay, that's it. Thank you for joining me.